Thank you. Our last uh, speaker before we have a chance to uh, interrogate the panelists uh, is uh, Dr. Uh, Jocelyn Lockyer. Uh, Dr. Lockyer is Senior Associate Dean for Education in the University of Calgary's Faculty of Medicine and responsible for education of all types and in all settings in that uh, faculty. And uh, she's going to talk to us about physician assessment. I'm going to talk about two programs, one the PAR, or Physician Achievement Review Program, which is a multi-source feedback program, and then our most recent program, which is the Physician Learning Program. And you'll see, very, you'll see similarities with what you're doing. I think we're all at pretty much the same stage and trying to figure out how to do assessment of our physicians and support them. Uh, I can get this to work. Oh, perfect. So I'm from the province of Alberta, which is right here. There's two major cities, um, Calgary and Edmonton. They're about the same size, about 1.2 million. And uh, the two medical schools are fairly comparable. We both have the same undergraduate class size, although our curriculum is a three-year curriculum. Theirs is a four-year curriculum. We're both probably running about 70 residency programs in different specialties. And we're, uh, we, at the time I'm, we started um, the physician learning program, both had uh, continuing medical education departments. So some of the history from Alberta was that there, there was a recognition by our regulatory authority, that is our College of Physicians and Surgeons of Alberta, that physicians were getting very little feedback to guide improvement, and thus began the multi-source feedback program known as PAR. Um, the college uh, stumbled a bit. They couldn't quite get it together. They approached the University of Calgary to help them develop the instruments because in continuing medical education, continuing professional development, we had some expertise in need surveys. We also had the only scanner in the province in the mid-90s. So thus, we're eminently qualified to handle data, right? Uh, yeah, I know. Uh, <laughs> The, um, but the universities were engaged not only with the instrument development, but also with some of the conceptualization of the aftercare and uh, a program for those physicians who were flagged to serve on committees. So the program is set up so that every physician would have multi-source feedback every five years that it would be questionnaire-based. Um, as Dr. Farmer mentioned, roughly it's eight colleagues, eight coworkers, 25 patients uh, who each provide data, very discreet and different questionnaires for uh, pro data provided by each of those groups. And the focus is, if you take the CanMeds roles, much more on a communication collaboration professional, although there's some aspects of scholar and medical expertise. Uh, but it's set up deliberately so patients address questions around um, communication, professionalism, uh, where co coworkers, that is nurses, psychologists, would provide data uh, about communication, collaboration, professionalism, but not medical expertise. So there were seven, seven different suites of instruments developed for major specialty groupings. Remember, Alberta is a small province, three and a half million people, currently about 8,000 physicians. So there was no way the regulator could develop unique instruments for each of the groups. And the questionnaires uh, address items that can be observed because in multi-source feedback, the most important thing is to not to have people guess at answers, but to have people selected to address questions that they actually can answer because they've seen that behavior. So you can see that there's a range of items. Uh, clearly on the anesthesia instrument, I think they have about 11 items on the patient questionnaire. It's a pretty brief encounter while the patient is awake. Um, 
And, and in fact, uh, when we developed the instruments for lab medicine and radiology, uh, they did not end up with a patient questionnaire. They ended up with a peer questionnaire and then other, other physician questionnaire and then a coworker questionnaire. So there's some variability. If you're interested, all the um, instruments uh, can be found on the PAR website. Whoops, it's, uh, actually that's wrong. It's par-org.ca, sorry. And what we found over time was that about a half of the physicians reported making changes in their practice. The changes tended to be things that were in the physician's control um, and uh, included things about stress as well as communication. Um, but things that were harder, at least, at least as tested in the first three months, were less likely. So if the physicians had to negotiate with their colleagues to buy uh, new equipment for the office or new, uh, better phone systems, more after-hour coverage, something like that, that was less likely to be ha happened, happen. Um, and most of the physicians felt that they got uh, valuable feedback. Over time, though, uh, while PAR is, is still exists, every physician does participate. Uh, it was recognized that this was not a terminal point, but the physicians needed much more focused data about their clinical practices. And my counterpart at U of A, I was Associate Dean Continuing Professional Development at the time. My counterpart, Chris DeGara, a colorectal surgeon, and I identified the need um, to get physicians better data about their practice. We recognized that CME courses, while laudable and lots of fun to do, really didn't give you much in the way of gain. And, and there was certainly evidence that uh, care could be improved across the province. And so the physician learning program was born to provide feedback to physicians about their practice, identify opportunity, and, and with the intent that it would help them identify opportunities for professional development. And the idea was that we could use provincial data, either data collected um, at the point of, of billing or within the hospital system, or within some other data collection uh, system to help the physician. So it ended up that we were able to negotiate, physicians negotiate their fees with the, through the Alberta Medical Association with the government. The Alberta Medical Association stepped up to the plate, and as part of their negotiations, in addition to fee for service, they also negotiate other benefits. We became a benefit. Um, and so we ended up with a program that was very much um, a collaboration with a steering committee representing the government, the hospital system, the regulatory system, the medical association, and the two universities. The intent was grassroots, physician-driven, and we would be working with groups of physicians, groups that came out of divisions or departments in hospitals or the university, clinics, or other collections of, of physicians. So essentially the plan is, uh, the global plan, although there's variability, uh, was that a group would identify something they wanted to, to figure out about their practices. They would work with the office to conceptualize the program. We would get it approved by the steering committee. It would have to go through ethics um, because often they would want to be able to publish it. But, but also we wanted to be sure that uh, it was done appropriately. The work then became, okay, can we really find the data to support this question? Uh, because, you know, people can dream up any kind of question, but sometimes the data just doesn't emerge very easily. And then uh, the plan would be they do the work, get the data for the individual physicians, but then a variety of educational strategies would be used in order to ensure the uptake. Um, and then you do some process of remeasurement. So that's the general procedure. 
one of the first projects that was undertaken was uh, to give family physicians data about their practice. We had this vision that if physicians were better informed about what they were actually doing and seeing the services they were providing, then they could say, oh, gee, 40% of my patients are women between 20 and 40. I better hop to the plate and go to those continuing medical education courses. In fact, what happened, um, so, so you can see the kind of data that was provided, uh, were provided to the physicians, um, and it took us about five or six algorithms to kind of figure out who what patients actually belong to what doctors and what doctors were actually doing by site because often physicians were working in multiple sites. Um, but once we got that, we sat down, the physicians had an opportunity to sit down with somebody and just review their data, peer physician, and try to figure out what the data meant to them, how they might use it. Unlike our dream that this would help them with C CPD, in fact, what it did was it helped them figure out what they were doing in their practice, how they might modify their practice, how they might um, focus their time or scheduling patients better. Uh, but, I, but I think it did help them understand their practice. The other pro project that, uh, because remember, this is all project-based, another project that was done was the pediatric anesthesiologists in our children's hospital, about 15 or so of them wanted to look at their tonsils and aden adenoid surgery um, using hospital data. So then we were able to uh, mine the data in their hospital. And the part of the, uh, after they got their data, they had morning rounds for an hour. It was led by a physician. And then they had a slide presentation. And I'll show you some of the components of that. But at that presentation, each physician had their own report. And the presentation reviewed how they came to the data and um, and then what the group had done in terms of performance. They used eye clickers. I'm sure you've used clickers where, you know, A, B, C, D, you know. Um, and then they had uh, some Q&A to get people to uh, share their thoughts publicly with their peers and, and I guess to come up with a plan for the next phase. So just, um, they had some data about procedures and um, you can see in the top, oh here, so if I can get this. there's me, because the physician would have his or her own data uh, and then they'd have some comparators. So they got some information about the procedures that were done, they looked at uh, airway and endotracheal tube stuff, they looked at induction types and how they did compared with the group looked at inhalational agents, because that was important, I guess, to them, rates of medication use, the types of medication. And then, as I said, they had a conversation using eye clickers, so there would be some level of anon anonymity where they could um, ask, could look at, I'm surprised at my rates of X in comparison to my colleague, and, and talk about uh, whether they were a one or they weren't surprised at all whether they thought the data was consistent, uh, whether the data contained surprises. So they had a discussion. And the, the plan w is for them to revisit the data. It took, they, then they came up with some kind of a consensus about what they should be doing as a group. And then the data will be reanalyzed again in three or six months. The project has a number of little program has a number of projects working on it in, in the areas you'd really expect, um, somewhat driven by the leadership, uh, but nonetheless uh, trying to scoop up as many uh, specialties as possible and as could be dealt with. Uh, two offices exist, one at the University of Alberta, one at the University of Calgary, taking on slightly different work but in a complementary way. I think if, though, if we think about key learnings um, from our perspective, and I have no idea whether they're translatable into another, other settings, but the big messages are long-term funding and commitment. 
the physician learning program well laudable, floundered for three or four years while we waited for the medical association to do its negotiations and finalize money. So we were given money in dribs and drabs, uh, but finally, finally they got a deal that'll take them to 2018, so secure funding. You absolutely need people in an organization that are committed to the sustainability and long-term success. I think the PAR program taught us that. Um, both do the late Dr. Brian Ward and uh, John Swinarski worked on the program with uh, the University of Calgary and U of A's uh, support in the instrument development, but they absolutely supported it from about 1993 to the present time. Uh, and if you don't have that commitment, if you're just thinking of it as a short-term thing, it, it just doesn't work. We have to recognize that you do need a significant infrastructure, particularly when you start to work with clinical data. You know, the collection and provision of data is expensive, trying to figure out what data is needed, engaging the physicians, it's all expensive, but you also need significant expertise. Communication is absolutely critical. You have to be totally honest with the physicians at the get-go. If it's a formative quality improvement, it better not change to summative. Although, although having said that, when data is egregious enough, the profession does have to step in, absolutely, but, the, but recognize that there are limits to a quality improvement program, but you do have to be very clear to the physicians at the get-go what the um, potential outcomes could be. I think we do know that physicians will use data to inform practice change. Uh, Dr. Farmer talked about uh, the potential for audit and feedback. I'll talk about that a little bit later. I think what we're starting to recognize, though, is that you can't just provide data. You really have to figure out how you can add people to um, help the physician understand their data and come up with a plan on how they will use that data and how they will improve. And just some acknowledgments in addition to Dr. Daguerre, who helped with the physician learning program, the, the anesthesia project uh, people that were involved are listed there.